I made a musical sort of video about the motorcycle officers of the JFK assassination, but probably a lot of people won't understand what's going on there. So I'm going to make some where I uh, say what's going on. And I'm going to start with this officer here at Parkland Hospital. And this cop is identified by the Portal to Texas History and the Sixth Floor Museum as H.B. McLean. But this looks like the same officer on the right here, uh, mostly because he's wearing, because he's a motorcycle cop, and because he's wearing the same leather jacket with the fur collar, which is somewhat unusual. And the only cop I can identify at Parkland Hospital, where these both are, where both of them are, uh, is uh, the one that's identified as McLean. So I think this is the same officer. However, the other officer, the one on the left there, is known to be D.L. Jackson, and D.L. Jackson made notes on the night of the assassination, he said, and he identified the officer which accompanied the hearse, which is what's there, uh, to Love Field, and he did not say it was McLean. And in those notes he says, Shortly some officer walked up and told me they are taking the president out the other door. Come on, he said. I walked outside just as they were putting the casket into the hearse. Someone said, Jackson, a Secret Service agent is looking for you. Sergeant Steve Ellis asked me if I was going to escort the body to Love Field, and I said, I don't know about that. About that time, the agent walked up and asked if I had arranged for, net for the escort. And I said, yes, I'm ready to go when you are. Officer James Taylor asked me if I wanted him to go with me, and I said yes. And I turned to Sergeant Ellis and told him that Taylor and I were going to make escort to Love Field, and with that we left. So, if D.L. Jackson can be believed, and I don't see why he shouldn't be, the officer with him at Parkland Hospital here is James Taylor, not H.B. McLean. And McLean himself, in 2003, said that he accompanied LBJ uh, to Love Field, so he would not have accompanied the hearse if he accompanied LBJ. Okay. Then when they got ready to send Johnson to the airport, me and uh, somebody else, I don't know who it was, escorted him back out to the airplane out of Love Field. Did you, uh, did you see Johnson? I mean, were you were you beside him at any time? Oh yeah, we, when he come out to get in the car, and then when he got out. Do you recall any anything about his expression, the way he looked, um, no. what what he might have been feeling at that point? I think he's wanting to get out, get the hell out of Dodge. So I conclude that it is Taylor with Jackson, and also that it is Taylor in the other photo that they're both uh, Taylor, that he's wearing the leather jacket at Parkland Hospital. And there's another reason to think it's Taylor. Taylor has a distinctive cleft chin, and the color photo here is from an online obituary for James H. Taylor. And the one on the left there is the way it appears on the web page, and on the right there, I just mirrored it, because when you mirror the image online, the dimple matches exactly the dimple of the officer at Parkland Hospital. So in my view, I have conclusively identified this officer as James H. Taylor. It is not H.P. McLean. So it's Taylor with Jackson in the hearse, and it's Taylor in front of the hospital with the Secret Service agents. And the reason I got so interested in identifying this officer is because this same officer, this same man, is present at Oswald's arrest at the Texas Theater. I'm sure it's the same officer because he's got the same chin and he has the same jacket. The chin will be good enough for me but he's wearing the same jacket too and he's kinda sorta dressed as a motorcycle officer. But if you'll note in this picture the one at the Texas Theater, the one on the left, is not wearing a Dallas police helmet. He doesn't have the insignia on the helmet. So he got the same chin but a different helmet. And this apparent officer at the Texas Theater, he's not wearing a police helmet, he's wearing the same jacket, and I have McLean on here because this is an old graphic, but he's wearing Taylor's jacket, 
and he has no gun on his side. And he has no stripe on his pants either. The motorcycle officers all have stripes on their pants. I don't know why that is. It might be because of the tra they're in the traffic division. I never could figure out exactly why they had stripes on their pants. But he should have a stripe on his pants. And he should have a gun on his side. And uh, so I conclude that that person, even though he casually looks like a motorcycle officer, actually is not dressed as a policeman. He's dressed so he can be mistaken as a policeman. I think this probably means that he went in, you know, carrying the helmet and not looking like a policeman. I don't know why, but I think that's what happened. Also, this might explain why he's wearing the leather jacket in the first place. That leather jacket, if you're in a situation where someone thinks you're a cop, it looks fine, you look like a cop. But if you're wearing that without the helmet, then you don't look like a cop. You just look like some guy in a leather jacket. And I think that's why Taylor is wearing a leather jacket on the day of the assassination, so that he could go do this thing at the Texas Theater. He's also not wearing a Dallas police shirt. You can't see much of it here, but you can see it's kind of a light blue color, and uh, the, cop, the officer in front of him is wearing this kind of shirt the Dallas police wear, which is a dark blue. So... This apparent officer is not in uniform, and it's James Taylor. And this is back at Parkland Hospital after Oswald's arrest. People will argue about the timing of all this, but the timing will work out. And I think it's obvious here that he's disappointed that he's being photographed up close. And I think the reason is because he was at Oswald's arrest, and he saw the camera there, too. And he doesn't want it known that he's that same officer. And here the Secret Service man pokes his head in. And he's obviously disappointed that McLean is being photographed. And he says, McLean says, I know, right there. And then this other officer realizes they don't want him photographed, so he gets in front of the camera. I think this is all very incriminating. They all know they're covering up something anyway. I don't know what this officer knows. But then after there's a diversion... With the, with the car coming by, the, the cameraman goes back to uh, Officer Taylor, and once again, he looks disappointed that he's being photographed up close. And so it all fits together. He's the officer that was at Oswald's arrest, and he's uncomfortable with that possibly becoming known through the photography. And this back to earlier in the day, uh, shortly after the president arrived, this is the Atkins film. And it's almost as if Atkins was told to stand there and take this film because it provides uh, something of an alibi for Taylor because there he is standing right there at Parkland Hospital. So you couldn't think that that was him at the Texas Theater, could you? And I put this graphic together to demonstrate that... Uh, Although it's not the same moment that uh, in the Atkins film there, the color on the left, this motorcycle officer, presumably it's Taylor, uh, Taylor and both, is standing in the same position that he was in the other photo when, with the Secret Service agents there. And, uh, and uh, parked right nearby is a three-wheel motorcycle. And in the 1970s, when the HSCA was investigating the so-called acoustic evidence theory, that the theory that shots could be heard on the uh, supposed the open mic on the Channel One Dicta Belt recording, uh, uh, several officers, or two at least, uh, Bowles and I forget who the I think McLean, said that the record. Uh, from listening to the recording, it was obvious to them that the sounds produced by the open mic were produced by a three-wheel motorcycle. So there's the three-wheel mo three motorcycle right by the apparent uh, star actor of the day, uh, James H. Taylor, at Parkland Hospital. So I think that's him at Parkland Hospital after he has produced the radio interference, which uh, they refer to as an open mic. And I think the radio interference was produced in order to hide communications of the assassins in Dealey Plaza. This video is not about that, so I'll say no more about it. 
but I think that uh, that was one of uh, Officer uh, Taylor's jobs. Probably his main job was to do that. And he did other things too. And I think he was a big insider on Assassination Day, even though he didn't shoot the president. Now, there's not much information available on James Taylor. The most I could find comes from his online obituary. And I want to go over a little bit of that. It says he joined the Dallas Police Department in 1955. However, just before that, it says he proudly served his country in the U.S. Army during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened after 1955, when he joined, when he was, presumably when he was working for the police department. I think that might be a cryptic way of saying that he was involved with the assassination conspiracy because of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that he felt that, and his co-conspirators, that uh, Kennedy needed to go. And I think he was a full knowing member of what happened, and he's proud of it, that he thinks it's a patriotic thing to have done. Anyway, it says um, it says a little more about what happened afterwards, and he says it says here he was part of the motorcade escorting President Kennedy, and was also responsible for crowd control at Parkland Hospital. Well, we can see him doing the crowd control in that film where he's being photographed up close, so that matches what he did there. Now he was not officially in the motorcade. Uh, maybe he's uh, calling, uh, accompanying the hearse to Parkland to uh, Love Field. Maybe he's calling that being in the motorcade. And for some people out there, they'll enjoy that he was a 32nd degree uh, Freemason and a member of the Scottish Rite for over 50 years. And his family and dog loved him. Well, you probably heard it here first, because I've never heard anybody else mention this guy. His only mention in any of the evidence uh, from the day of the assassination is what uh, D.L. Jackson said in the notes he wrote. And those notes didn't become public for several years. There's even a version where the names are redacted. I don't, I don't know when they first became public. But he somehow escaped public scrutiny. And yet I think he was a major player in the activities of the day. I think very few are as guilty as James H. Taylor. Well, maybe a couple dozen others.